So I've got a short slide deck for you today and we'll go through and try and categorize how we are in the overall market. So we'll look at a, a few things. We'll look at the content side quickly. We'll look at the screen technology, screens in the, in the house, those kind of things. So quickly running through this, let's have a start with what's actually happening in the overall market for movies. So this is, uh, this is the opening gambit and I suppose the most important thing to note here is that movie consumption overall is actually quite stable. It's, uh, it's, it's not dropped off too much. I and mean, I'd like to draw your attention to two things in this graphic. Um, one of them is the blue line. That's, uh, that's physical media. So that's DVDs and Blu-rays and things like that. That market is starting to decline and it's causing a lot of you know, overall panic in, in some quarters. But the interesting thing that's happening here is that theatrical growth is, uh, is, is really compensating for that. And the two bits at the top, that's all of your online and VOD. So not really making that much of an impact on the overall market, but where we do see a lot of change is in theatrical. Theatrical revenue is very, very stable. The important thing about that is that 3D lends itself very well to theatrical, so obviously what we've been seeing here. And two things that we'll look at quickly here. These are quite dense slides, so uh, I'll walk through them not too rapidly. Um, we've got the growth of the number of pieces of content that are being produced so that's the bars on the side. This is split between live action and animation. And so robust growth over the last few years. You can see the forecast there. So those are films that have been, um, have been slated and we, we're, we're expecting release. The drop that we see in 2012 and 2013 is, of course, because there are pieces of content that have not yet been announced that will be made. So we expect the growth to continue quite strongly over the next couple of years as well. The pie chart next to that is telling us what genres of content these are. So we can see action, adventure, comedy, etc. And there's quite a diverse range of content types that are being produced in 3D, and that's of course what we've seen in the previous presentation. A couple of things that I think are interesting here are in the early stages of 3D, we saw quite a lot of content that I would uh, characterize as non-typical cinema content. So we saw things like music, uh, concerts, um, arts, the, you know, proper standing stage theatrical type things. So very, very diverse range of content types that were lending themselves to 3D. And that has really translated over the last couple of years into a wide range of content that's being produced and put out into the market. But there is a question as to whether or not 3D is going to retain the revenues that, uh, that it's promised in the past. These are movies that have come out in 2011. So this is our full slate of, uh, of 2011 films. The bar, the bars on that are split between 2D box office and 3D box office in terms of revenue, which is what you see on this side, the close side. The, the line that runs across it is the proportion of revenue that's allocated to, uh, to 3D rather than 2D. So we see the split of how much 3D is bringing to a theatrical release. The interesting thing here is that theatrical releases do still have quite a strong split between 2D and 3D revenue. And it seems to have stabilized around about you know, 50, 56%. So some markets are stronger than others, but 3D doesn't dominate exclusively when it comes to a 3D piece of content that has been put out into the market. There's still a lot of revenue accruing to the 2D version of that content as well. So that's the theatrical side quickly. Now if we go into the home, there's a very different picture. We have a lot of opportunity to put 3D content into the living room, but there's a big problem with 3D TVs and TV availability. And this, just our opening slide, how do we, how do we get 3D TVs into the home? There are a couple of technologies which I won't bore you with too much, but what we've mostly seen at the moment are active screens being produced. They're cheaper and they're easier to make well, they have been traditionally, because you can use existing panels that are being produced. What we're starting to see is a lot more polarized technology, which is passive glasses. A little bit easier on the eyes, some might argue, but I'm not going to get into that debate. Um, th those technologies are actually quite viable. They're quite cheap to put together if you change the panel manufacturing, which is what started to happen in, in particular LG uh, with their um, film pattern retarder technology. That layer, of, uh, that layer on, top of the, on top of the screen is quite cheap once the factory process has been changed around in order to implement it. So we're starting to see a bit of a, a mix of TV types, 
passive as well as active. And there's obviously the first auto stereo screen that's gone out into the market as well, which is a Toshiba screen. Uh, some might argue that that's a little bit pricey, and uh, I think it's an interesting product to watch. But we're really not looking at uh, auto stereo becoming a major part of the market for at least a few years, just based on price, but also based on the viewing experience, which again, I'm not going to talk too much about the viewing experience, and uh, that's up to everyone else to make an opinion on that. Um, there is not going to be quite the uptake in 3D TV in the home, viewing in particular, as we might expect just by looking at the number of TV sets that are sold as well. So this is a number of TV sets, 3D TV sets, sold in the US and international markets. They, the bars, again, color-coded to, to tell you two different things. One of them is the number of 3D TVs total, and the other one is the number of 3D TVs that have been sold with sets of glasses. So we have a lot of 3D TVs going out into the market that don't have any glasses in the, in the box. And so asking the consumers to go to an aftermarket and buy another piece of equipment often limits very, very strongly the uptake of that technology. This is helped over the next few years by passive glasses, by polarized glasses. Much, much cheaper to make, much easier to bundle in the box. Some products are now coming with seven different glass, seven pairs of glasses in the box, whereas other high-end products that have uh, shutter glasses, active glasses, they, you know, they, at the very top end, there are still TV sets that are sold without glasses in the box. So again, driving an aftermarket makes the technology much harder to push consumers towards because they may not even realize that the product has 3D or switch over to it at all until you give them the glasses. So that, that changeover is going to happen from the consumer electronics vendors, but at the moment there is not enough consumer demand for 3D to create the added value that's required in order to make sure you can afford to put especially shutter glasses in the box because they're expensive. So that's the TV side. The other side that is very interesting is the Blu-ray side, so 3D Blu-rays, um, BD 3D. The 3D BD, I can't remember which way around. The uh, two ends of this spectrum are the console market, so the PlayStation 3, which has a firmware upgrade, which uh, has most, in most cases already been implemented uh, to virtually everyone who's got a plugged in uh, PlayStation. That allows for 3D content to be viewed using the Blu ray player inside the PlayStation. The other side of it is Blu ray players standalone, and Blu ray players have mostly shifted towards Profile 5, which has the 3D element already built into it. So we're starting to see, we see quite good uptake in the Blu-ray market, and the PlayStation install base is very, very sizable, and has switched over a huge number of households to the capability to watch 3D off a Blu-ray disc. So the problem in many cases is limited more to the screens and the lack of glasses in the screens rather than the Blu-ray players. So Blu-ray and PlayStation um, installed base is really doing very good things to the opportunity to get content into homes. So that's what happens when we put it all together and I'll explain this slide quickly. There are three lines on this. There's the 3D TV line which is the top black line. There's the PlayStation 3 and the forecast for PlayStation 4 next-gen lines, and there's the Blu-ray 3D um, line as well. So the Blu-ray 3D being the blue line in the middle. When we add these together, when we stack all of these things up and try and work out how many people, how many active households there can be, that's the dotted line at the bottom. So that's the compound of all of the TVs with a Blu-ray player with, or with a PlayStation that could actually watch, so have the entire ecosystem in their homes. So you can see there's quite a lot of limitation because there are several moving parts here and because not everyone has bought all of the component technologies that are required. So now we get on to the content element, and this is, uh, this, this is arguably a major uh, problem for growth at the moment and uptake because there isn't really enough content, especially Blu-ray content that can be sold into the home yet. But there are quite a lot of good signs and indications as we saw already in the last presentation. There's a lot of producer interest in 3D. There's also a lot of broadcaster interest in 3D. And I think that's going to be one of the most important elements over the next few years. 3D TV channels being aired on pay TV platforms with high quality 3D content available 24 hours a day, that's going to be probably the single biggest driver to getting 
consumers to buy 3D TVs and watch them. And we've got quite a lot of broadcast launches already. We've got 30, 30 plus broadcast you know, standalone channel launches. This is the spread of countries that they're in. It's uh, a huge number of additional 3D launches that have been, have been uh, noted or announced. And there's also a huge number of what we call one-off or event-based channels. So these are actually, at the moment, have been more frequent, larger numbers than the standalone full-time channels. So there's been about 35 one-off events, mostly associated with sports and, and, and sports events. So all of, this, all of this is trying to drive an ecosystem where consumers are able to watch 3D if they want to. And the reason that broadcasters are doing this are twofold. One of them is there's a public service technology interest element to it. So broadcasters wanting to push 3D out into the market to allow their consumers, to allow their audience to, to watch that type of content. But really what's going to drive a lot of the uptake is if pay TV operators can find a way of charging for monetizing 3D. And at the moment that hasn't really happened. So it's mostly been, it's mostly been bundled with uh, HD subscription and just trying to drive some kind of audience interest. But once we get good content, once we get enough content to support standalone channels, um, there's a very high probability that 3D is going to start generating money for pay TV operators, which works its way all the way back down the supply chain to ultimately the producers. So what types of content have we seen on the, on the pay TV side, at the very least, on the broadcaster side? It's mostly not live sports, except for those events that we've seen. So event-based sports are not often enough and filmed often enough in 3D to make them the, the staple of, uh, of this industry. We see a lot more movies and documentaries being put out by broadcasters and pay TV operators at the moment. And they do offer an uplift, these kind of video-on-demand assets, on HD content. You can see the uplift up to about 40% in some cases. And that's real, genuine premium on supporting a 3D piece of content on a broadcaster pay TV operator network. So 3D, VOD, large, you know, large volume uh, revenue opportunity there because you can charge that extra for the content type for the technology element within that. The sports stuff, by contrast, is Know, infrequent, expensive to make, and doesn't normally have an associated uplift in terms of uh, consumer spend on that particular product. It's normally within an HD package, so let's say an HD sports package. So, taking one more step into the value chain further down, and we're looking now at the the, the movies industry, so the producer industry, and these are the uh, these are the supporting elements. So all of the all of the major studios you can see on there, and the number of pieces of content that they've been putting out over the last couple of years. This is uh, actually I would say quite a large volume of options. Now there's the question about what pieces of content this this is, how many of them are converted pieces versus native 3D uh, pieces. There's quite a wide range of support, and it's across a lot of different. Uh, different genre types as well. So there is a Blu-ray market that's available to consumers in most countries. In some countries, there's, uh, there's, there's a little bit more of a market than in others. Um, in particular, in, in Germany, there's a lot of, uh, of converted content, another 100 or so pieces of content that have been converted locally in, in the German market, and those are available within Germany to, uh, to the consumer market there. The problem with the, well, one of the interesting things that's happened in that case is that we haven't seen a, a correlated increase in consumer spend or number of titles bought or anything like that, given the increase in, in availability that's in the market. But again, this can be due to several factors, consumer understanding, the, uh, the type of pieces of content and whether or not consumers find that interesting. There has been quite a lot of, uh, of content that's being produced especially in that market, as post-converted. And that maybe has some problems longer term because some of the post-converted content isn't as good quality as other pieces. So there's a, very, there's, there's a lot of content available in most different markets, and so far we haven't seen too much uplift from the one market that, do ha that does have uh, a lot of extra content available. So putting that all together, are consumers buying 3D Blu-ray discs? And they are slowly creeping up, and we have, we're forecasting that by about 2014, 2015, there will actually be a sizable market. At the moment, we're 
quite close to the, to the beginning of this curve, so there's only been about a year and a half of, uh, of, of content availability, and now we're starting to push up towards, uh, towards a much wider market for consumers and an unbundled market as well. So we've, we've, started, to, we've started to see a move away from general availability only via a particular device purchase, so bundling with, uh, with a single piece of hardware, for example, in order to drive uptake, that's really stopped, that's really gone away with one notable exception. Um, so of all of the content, of all of the device types that we have in the home, there is still a lot of uh, growth and interest and opportunity. A few of them that are worth pointing out is uh, 3D capable um, PCs, so there's start to be some monitors and laptop combinations that have 3D capabilities in them. We've got PlayStation 3, Nintendo 3DS, and uh, we're, we have uh, Xbox 360 as well. Um, we've got a lot of opportunity to put content via gaming especially to particular high value consumers and drive that side of the, uh, of the market as well because 3D gaming of course has a particular audience that are often higher spend um, and, uh, and, and can afford early adoption technologies like 3D. 3D mobile as well, and again, we've seen a lot of this uh, in, in the previous presentation, so I won't bore you too much. It does still look like uh, a niche market. There's only a few products available at the moment, um, but we think that this is going to start to, uh, to develop quite quickly. Um, and so across the overall industry, so this big pie chart, which is not the easiest way of, uh, of visualizing all of the data, that's just telling you how big this general consumer industry is. So looking at games and tablets and uh, pay TV, which is the huge um, blue section, so that's pay TV and advertising and things like that that accrue to uh, that accrue um, to television sets for the most part. There's a lot of industry and a lot of billions of dollars of industry that are already active in the 3D market to some extent, in some capacity. And so translating some of that revenue into a revenue stream directly for 3D looks like quite a promising opportunity still. And that's the end. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sure. Help yourself. Uh, yes, it is up down. Um, uh, we've got time for a question or two to Tom, and I'll, let me kick this off. Um, so many people say that the 3D development in terms of television is tracking the early days of high def. Is that true, or is it an element of truth in that, from your knowledge? Um, the. Sorry. Didn't see it. Forgive me. Thanks very much. Hello? Yep. Um, there is an element of truth there. It's uh, that there, there has been a similar rate of uptake. Um, 3D's actually had a, a faster rate of uptake than HD so far in consumer devices, so in, in TV sets, for example. So there is, there is a parallel that can be drawn, but the real enabler for, for 3D is that it can be put directly into existing sets. So, so flat panel TVs really are the enabling technology for all of this. And if you look at the Blu-ray market and the uh, PlayStation market, the uptake that we see in those markets is entirely driven by the level of technology that we're dealing with. Being able to do things like firmware up upgrades for this is in, in existing consoles, for example, with the PlayStation 3, that is just such a huge help to kickstart the market. No, you, you, you deal in hard numbers. You're not there to give too many opinions, but, but is that is the lack of, of, of glasses being supplied in, in every or with every 3D television, um, is it, inevit inevitably this is a detriment, this is damaging the potential for the... Uh very much, very much. The, the, the glasses in the box problem, I think, is, is genuine. I think a lot of, there's very, very little aftermarket for well, almost any hardware associated with the TV, for example. People very rarely go out and buy universal remote controls or things like that. It's a very, very niche market compared to the size of the overall TV market. So really, putting things in boxes with the TV is vital. Yeah. The problem is, especially with active glasses, the cost is far too high. Consumers don't have any, don't show any willingness to spend um, extra. So if they have a 3D, if there's a 3D TV available on the market for whatever the price is, thousand dollars, and there's a 3D TV with glasses in the box, consumers aren't going to pay one thousand two hundred dollars just because the glasses are in the box. They'll always opt to buy the version without the glasses. Yeah. 
because it's cheaper. And there's the razor-thin margins that we have uh, in the displays industry, in the TV sets industry, just doesn't allow anyone, any of the, uh, any of the major CE vendors, to effectively put 3D glasses into the box unless they're using polarised technology. Now, this show is all about content. Um, in the discussions you've had uh, with the, as you like, the studios and the broadcasters themselves, um, how desperate are they for content, for 3D content? It is virtually the only topic of conversation. <laughs> it's uh, the, the uptake rate of the hardware is relatively healthy, um, but there isn't, there isn't much of an uptake in con genuine consumer interest in spending extra money on, on 3D for so for, for TV sets or for, uh, for Blu-ray players or anything like that. There's not very much uh, buying that feature or spending extra money on that feature. There's a lot more of, uh, of taking it when it's given. Yeah. So the content will, the content's really the key to pivot uh, consumer interest and to show consumers the value of the hardware that they're trying to buy or they're thinking of buying. And once you have that, you, can, you get a virtuous cycle where you can actually charge additional money for... 3D, either in the content or the hardware, or hopefully both. Uh, you've beautifully set up our next panel, which is, uh, which is content. <laughs> uh, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Great presentation as always.